In this video, we're writing a computer program for a Linux x86 system without an interpreter, a compiler, or an assembler. We're writing machine code by hand. First, let's write a short program in the usual Linux way. vi hello.c to edit, gcc hello.c to compile, and the result is an executable file containing instructions in machine language. We run it, and it prints hello world. Executable files are binary files, so if we want to inspect them or edit them, we cannot use an ordinary text editor. But we can create a hex dump using a tool like XXD that displays a binary file as plain text. In this output, the first column gives the number of bytes displayed so far in hexadecimal. The content is in hexadecimal as well, where each byte of the binary file is represented by a pair of hexadecimal numerals. It takes exactly two hexadecimal numerals on the screen to represent one byte in a binary file. In this file, the first byte is 7f, the second byte is 45, and so on. The last column shows the characters that are printable, more or less. Unprintable characters appear as a dot. XXD also has a plain output mode. We can save the hex dump in a file and edit it in an ordinary text editor. Now you can't just edit executable files and expect them still to work. But if we find the string hello in the executable and change one letter, it should work. In hello.dmp, the string hello is encoded in ASCII as 486566C6C6F. We change the second L of hello to an M. Now how do we convert this modified hex dump back into a binary? XXD has a reverse mode, and the binary runs and does what we want. And this is how we make binaries by hand. We write a .dmp file in a text editor, and then we undump the .dmp file into a binary by xxd-p-r. Here's the script I used to make executables. The script deals with all the .dmp files in this directory. We get the name of the new executable file by removing the filename extension .dmp. In each line of the .dmp file, we remove all characters after the first hash character, if any. This enables us to write comments in the .dmp files, and we undump using xxd-p-r. The new binary file gets execute permission in the file system. So here's our first program. We get syntax highlighting in Vim if we use a strange file name extension like .dmp and put a hash character first in the file. So the comments are grayed out. This program is very simple. It just exits right away by invoking the Linux x86 syscall exit. Only 12 bytes of this program are actual machine instructions. The rest, another 84 bytes, is paperwork we do to get the Linux system to accept this file as an executable. The paperwork is an ELF header. ELF is the executable and linkable format of Unix System 5, in which format Linux wants its executables. At some point, the makers of Linux looked at ELF and said, yeah, that's a good format, we'll use that. I don't know if Linux actually requires all the fields in the ELF form to be filled according to the ELF specification. All I know is, we want to fill in the ELF header well enough that Linux will run our machine code. So I need to know the ELF format. But I don't want to learn it by studying the output of tools like the compiler GCC, which puts out an ELF file of 8600 bytes, with 31 section headers and 9 program headers for our little Hello World program. It really should take only 100 bytes, 0 section headers, and 1 program header to run a program on Linux. So here's what I did. I read the Wikipedia page on ELF. At times I referred to the System 5 ABI document and the System 5 ABI supplement 386. We are interested mostly in chapters 3, 4, and 5 of those two documents. Links are in the description. And I consulted other sources on the web until I got my programs running. The first 16 bytes of the file make up the eIdent field. Of these 16 bytes, the first four identify this file as an ELF file. The fifth byte, 01, says this file is a 32-bit object file rather than 64-bit. This file contains numerical addresses. Due to our choice of 32-bit, the addresses are 4 bytes long and not 8 bytes long. 
Why did I choose 32-bit when nowadays most people have 64-bit CPUs and 64-bit operating systems? Well, I found the 32-bit rules to be a little simpler for our purpose. The sixth byte, 01, says we are presenting the entries of each field least significant byte first. This goes with Intel's little endian architecture. The seventh byte must be 01 according to the ABI. The eighth byte, 00, identifies the target OS. Zero is a non-answer we can get away with, and consequently we are supposed to answer zero for the ninth byte, too. There are seven more bytes to zero, according to the ABI. The E-type field indicates the object file type. Zero two indicates that this file is an executable. This field is two bytes long, and the number zero two indicating an executable file is encoded as zero two zero zero, not zero 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 two, because above we chose least significant byte first. The E-machine field contains zero three for x86 architecture, the E version field must contain 0, 01. The E entry field is the address of the entry point of the process. Let me explain. According to ABI Supplement 386, P align should be a power of 2, often 1000 in Big Endian hexadecimal. Our ELF file has 5 4 bytes of headers. If the machine code of our program appears in a segment that begins immediately after the headers, the code begins at offset 5 4. The place in memory where a segment begins is the segment's PV address. The ABI says PV address should be congruent to P offset modulo P align. So the segment containing our code should begin at an address that in Big Endian ends in 054. According to figure 325 of ABI supplement 386, the text region customarily begins at 08048000 in Big Endian. The next address, ending 054, is 08048054 in Big Endian, or 54800408 in Little Endian. The entry point of the process is the beginning of the program segment. The ELF format defines sections and segments. I think they start using the word program instead of segment, so they can use P for program and S for section in the field names. The EPH off field indicates where in the file the program headers begin. There are three four bytes of the ELF file header before our first ELF program header. The ESH off field indicates where in the file our section headers begin. Our ELF file has no sections. The E flags field contains zero according to ABI supplement 386. The EEH size field contains the size of this ELF header, three four. The EPH end size field contains the size of each program header, which is 2-0 in a 32-bit header. Field EPH num contains the number of program headers, which is 1 in our case. ESH end size is the size of each section header, which is 2-8 in a 32-bit header. ESH num is the number of section headers. We have none. ESH STR NDX is the index of the section header containing section names. We have none. Here, after 3-4 bytes, is our sole program header. See Chapter 5 of ABI Supplement 386 for some helpful illustrations. P-type is 01, as this header describes a loadable segment. P-offset is 5-4, the place in the file where the segment begins. P-V address is the place in memory of the segment. 54800408, as we discussed when we computed E-entry. P, P address is unused in x86, we set it to zero. P file size is the size of our segment as it appears in this file. Our segment is just long enough to contain our program, 12 bytes, hexadecimal, zero C. P mem size is the size of our segment as it appears in memory. This must be at least as great as P file size. We set them equal for this program. P flags contains the access permissions of the segment. A segment like ours that contains instructions for the CPU to read and execute should be readable and executable, so we set P flags to 4 plus 1 equals 5. P align should be 2 to the 12th for x86, that's 0010 in little and in hexadecimal. Now we are done with the headers. Here comes our program segment containing machine language instructions. I will explain the machine language in later videos and not in this one. 
but I can tell you that the first instruction is a five byte sequence that sets register EAX to one. There is a system call coming up and the number one in the EAX register will tell the system that we want syscall exit. The exit syscall has a status, a number from 00, 0 to FF. This status is passed as the first syscall parameter, which goes in register EBX in a Linux x86 system. Our second instruction is a 5-byte sequence that sets register EBX to 0, indicating a normal exit status. The third and final instruction is a 2-byte sequence that interrupts the CPU with parameter 80. This is how we trigger a syscall in the Linux x86 system. And that's it. We make the binary and run it. Dollar question mark contains the exit status of the program we just ran. We can change the exit status and remake the executable. Let's change it to 7. Seven. The program works. In the next video, we will look into the machine language.